Yeah, better. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are about to start our third day uh, of the assembly in the National Conference on Interdisciplinary Social Sciences here at the School of Philosophy at the National Encyclopedia University of Athens. Uh, a very warm welcome and good morning to all of you. Uh, today we're going to uh, have a special panel uh, for the Great Case, uh, and we're gonna, we are going to discuss the new paradigms and interdisciplinary changes in the social uh, sciences and the humanities and the focus is going to be on Greece. I am Eugenia Vanidis uh, from the uh, University of Patras. I do diversity and interculturality in education. And together with, with my colleague and friend, Vasiliki Savopoulou, who is the uh, uh, is director of this uh, panel. Vasiliki, always uh, industrious. She works a lot on these issues and um, uh, she had to deal with uh, interdisciplinarity in social sciences with, together with friends and colleagues. And we're very privileged to have a very special a cadre of people today with us to discuss and to reflect on this issue. So Vasiliki and I are going to moderate. Vasiliki uh, is going to give you the frame of this panel. And then I'm going to moderate in between the different panelists. And then Vasiliki will uh, uh, offer us uh, the final uh, remarks and some questions. And in between, I could actually offer my uh, reflections as well. So I give you the floor, Vasiliki, just to uh, give us a bit of um, uh, a framing of this uh, panel. Thank you. Slow and loud. Thank you. Uh, good morning, <clears throat> uh, everybody. Um, I apologize for my rough voice. Um, welcome to this uh, third day of our conference and uh, to this special panel on new paradigms <clears throat> and interdisciplinary exchanges in the social sciences and the humanities with a focus on Greece. Um, thank you for being here and I hope you're enjoying our conference. Um, first, I would like to, to thank uh, our panelists uh, who, as you will hear, uh, represent various uh, uh, social sciences and disciplines. In fact, uh, there is uh, in this panel, um, uh, we uh, not just social sciences, but also the humanities uh, are represented. And I think this is one of its strong points, the interdisciplinarity and uh, the exchanges between social sciences and humanities. Uh, so uh, we will hear um, our colleagues, uh, scholars uh, from disciplines such as folklore and in particular public folklore, classics uh, in relation to education, psychology, urban folklore and anthropology of design. Uh, our panelists um, will be uh, presenting uh, material, uh, cases, examples 
uh, relating to Greek society and culture, but also uh, to international issues uh, with interdisciplinary applications uh, regarding the concepts, analytical concepts uh, and methods that they would be presenting, and also the strategies that they have pursued in their own research. Uh, so um, what uh, you, we are going to uh, hear is uh, this uh, um, uh, interrelationship between local and global uh, in methodology, in research, and in social issues. Uh, and this is what uh, we keep in mind. Uh, now, I will not uh, take up more of your time because it is important to actually uh, hear uh, our um, uh, panelist colleagues. And uh, we will start uh, with uh, um, Tina Bukuvalas. I think that uh, Eugenia, Eugenia Arvanitis will be introducing our first uh, uh, speaker. Uh, I forgot to say about myself uh, uh, that um, uh, I am uh, an associate professor of folklore uh, with a background in classics and anthropology and always interested uh, in uh, um, uh, interdisciplinarity. So uh, good luck to our panel. And I look forward to hearing Thank you, uh, all Mr. this. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, uh... I'm going to ask uh, Tina Bukuvalas, a former director of Florida Cultural Resources and former president of the Florida Folklore Society, to deliver a, a her paper on Greek music in America, an examination of musical change and identity. Yeah, how can I how can I move it? Let's see it has embedded things that I need to get to. Just click on it. Yes. Okay, very good. No, thank you. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with my esteemed colleagues, and uh, I'm going to be speaking about Greek music in America as an examination of musical change and identity. For the Greek diaspora, music is an essential component of almost all their social identities. It links the past to the present, the distant to the near, and spins an intricate web of memories and information for the diaspora. And for many who are born in America, music actually invents a homeland for them. During the early 20th century, massive immigration combined with um, ethnic record production uh, and it generated unparalleled documentation of ethnic music in America. These are invaluable documents of musical practices that depict immigrants' daily lives, problems, and social issues. And Greeks in America and their music have an enduring influence on music in Greece and in other diaspora communities. What Gail Holst noted regarding one genre was true of many. She said, the history of Rebecca, both as a recorded and live genre, has always been closely linked to the emigrating communities in the United States. From the 1880s to 1920s, almost half a million Greeks arrived in the United States. At first, they were 90% male and most never intended to stay, but half of them did. They found work across the nation in cities, but also in um, railroad construction, mines, and factories. 
In the early days when they had nothing, sharing music to them was something that gave them comfort and was a way they could again participate in their homeland. Uh, migratory work and separation were new to Greece by any stretch of the imagination. And the song genre of city theater about uh, distant lands uh, was something that expressed their loss and desolation. Some people, like a uh, Cretan lyric player, uh, Haralaus Ibarakis, who spent most of his life in America, also wrote songs like this one about the West. Okay. as well as instrument makers. Um, and by 1910, the Café Amman tradition appeared in urban areas. Greek music soon became available in new technological forms, such as music cylinders, um, uh, records, and uh, player pianos. In 1896, Michael Arakteki uh, recorded the first Greek music uh, in America on the New York label of Berliner. Uh, European and uh, then American uh, uh, music label field agents went around the world recording ethnic music for people in America because it continued their sales and also sold gramophones. Um, by early 1917, Kiriaki and Tonopulu, also known as Kiriakula, recorded 34 songs in Greek and sometimes Turkish for Columbia Records in New York. Her recordings ignited the boom period of Greek recording in America. And in 1918, there's Kiriakula. Uh, in 1918, Columbia issued um, a, a Greek record catalog with domestic and import, imported 78 RPM records. During, uh, during World War I, I'm gonna go back. Oops. During World War I, 60,000 Greek immigrants served in the US armed forces and many more returned to Greece. Um, they believed that the Magali idea would become reality with the defeat of the, with the, defeat of the Ottomans and that they would retake um, what they believed were Greek lands. Eleftheria, or freedom, performed by Marika Papakika, was based on George M. Cohen's over there. The lyrics encourage the soldiers to plant the Greek flag on Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Okay, how can I? Uh... Musicians in the U.S. realized they had more freedom of expression than they were permitted in Greece, and the wealth of diaspora Greeks made them a major, major audience for the arts, and one that bought more records than almost any other ethnic group. They soon established independent record uh, companies. In fact, um, Kiria Pula and her husband established Pan Linian Phonograph Records in New York in 1919. In Chicago, the Greek record company was founded in 1922. Sheet music also was published um, for Greek music 
for musicians, theatricals, choirs, and informal gatherings. <clears throat> In the US, priests and others composed new liturgical music, which abandoned Byzantine modes and single vocal lines. They presented their progressive style with European style choirs and, and organs. Uh, one prominent proponent was George Anastasiu of Target Springs, who formed the Damaskeros Byzantine Choir. And these choirs also uh, raised the level of participation of women in the Orthodox Church in America. By 1925, Gus and Marika Papagika uh, opened arguably the first multinational cafe Amman in the US. Since their music shared many elements, it attracted not only Greek patrons, but also Albanians, Arabs, Armenians, Bulgarians, Jews, Macedonians, and Turks. Moreover, the people who participated in playing Greek music in America were never solely Greek, but were always part of these groups. And even in this cafe of Man, Marika Papadika would be singing some songs in Armenian, for instance. Uh, music released from 1918 to 33 includes, included folk and popular songs, serenades, operettas, and religious music. In 1927, uh, Nikolaus Rubanis wrote the lyrics for the best known Greek song in America, Mr. Lou, and Tetos Dimitriadis made the first recording. Other new Greek songs commented on social realities like the Roaring Twenties uh, and talked about uh, Tosia Dimitriadis talked about cutting her hair and smoking in the 1927 hit, Tot uh, Constantinople born singer, orchestra leader, and record company executive, Tetos Dimitriadis had a major impact. From uh, 1930 to 31, he made over 200 recordings in Greece that were not released here, but were released in America because um, there was a dictatorship in Greece that didn't allow certain topics um, in music. So um, these topics, such as a mixed language lyrics, there were gypsy musicians, uh, they talked about drug use and sex, were in America, but not here. And he recorded people like Rosa Eskenazi, uh, Abadzi, Dagas, and many others who became stars in Greek America. In 1932, uh, Jack Gregory, Ioannis Halakias, recorded two bazooki instrumentals, Tomisterio and Minore Tuteke. Um, in 1933, he recorded two more. These were the first widely popular recordings of bazooki in Greece or the United States. And his interpretation became a significant influence on music in Greece. Um, Music recorded from 1933 to 45 reflected many crises and uncertainties. Um, some of the Greek immigrants reacted to the depression uh, by gambling, drinking, and shirking responsibility. And this was often given voice in Rebecca, uh, like Dimitriadis's, uh, um, I'll just translate, at Marigos Teke, which is like a club, or Olimera Pesi Zaria. Uh, by George Katsaros, All Day Playing Dice. Um, other songs depicted uh, social ills such as tuberculosis or black lung that ravaged minors, like Katsaros, Manamu Ime Visikos, Mother I Am Sick. Other songs chronicled returning home to escape the depression or what they felt was rejection in America, only to find that they no longer fit into society in Greece. Some men turn back to Greece for brides. Uh, this, uh, and this is sheet music for a song uh, called Mother Don't Send Me to America, which was written in Greece, uh, but was also recorded in America because the men came over and they wanted to take the brides to America and not everyone was happy about this. After Greece fell to Germany, Greek Americans supported the Greek war relief effort with rallies, home relief work, and war bond sales that became occasions for music and dance. They also played anti-access 
songs that were recorded in Greece, and U.S. companies released sheet music such as this one. The devastation of World War II, followed by the Civil War, precipitated another major wave of immigration from Greece to America. Um, at that time, after the war, nightclubs emerged from, uh, from the tavernas that played predominantly Suzuki music. In New York, uh, clubs like Port Said Cafe or Britannia clustered around 8th Avenue. Also, there were hotels and music venues like Chicago's Aragon Ballroom that featured popular Greek nights. Um, there were Horo Esperidas, which were a variety of dance shows with music and dance that were popular. And the music was also available on jukebox, in restaurants, and clubs, bars, and sweet shops. And there were Greek hours on, on the radio. Post-war recordings were very eclectic. Um, the largest independent label, Liberty Records, included Nanda Nanda, which were mandolin bands, which performed folk and European music among their releases. Um, now, artists continue to combine American musical traditions with Greek musical traditions. Um, so uh, I want to play you one, uh, a little bit of one cut uh, by uh, <clears throat> Nikos Gunaris. Uh, it's actually you know, a traditional uh, Kalamatianos um, called Tria Feria Boliotica, but done very much in post war style. Oops. The rise of the bazooki was, of course, uh, major at the time, and it was signaled by such songs as To Bazooki Sinanariki by uh, Nikos Kuporakis and Dodoros Kaporakis. Um, a lot of new labels emerged that, that produced just Greek records, such as Greco Records, and um, Finally, the first uh, in 1958, Greek American clarinetist and orchestra leader Gus Valley recorded the first Greek LP on a major label. The Greeks have a song for it on United Artists. Valley grew up in New York. His, his parents were from Asia Minor, uh, but he started playing with Artie Shaw and Louis Prima. And in the 50s, then played Greek American Middle Eastern and fusion music. The 62 LP of Greek and Dixieland had one side devoted to Dixieland and another side to Greek hits. In, um, in the late 50s and early 60s, um, there were um, uh, new musical forms that came about, um, uh, like Mayuko. Um, one was in Techno Maiko with recorders like uh, with composers like Manos, Hajidakis, and Theodorakis, who created film scores like For Never on Sunday. And these films actually, in and of themselves, had a major impact in America. Um, uh, the music, for instance, uh, from uh, Never on Sunday became part of the popular repertoire in America. And the whole perspective about Greek Americans changed in America because of these films. Uh, Greeks who used to be perceived as sort of too dark and too foreign suddenly became, uh, uh, were viewed as being imbued with a sort of joie de vivre that uh, Americans tried to emulate and they flocked to the Bazookia uh, where they started to have music, um, they started to have belly dancers partly to 
Americans, and um, uh, and it became very chic to be Greek, as we say. Um, this was uh, the 60s and 70s were a time of a lot of Greek recordings, um, such as the Greek Down USA uh, records. Trio Bel Canto became very popular, which played uh, sort of uh, uh, a combination of cantatas and popular music. Um, but um, what I want to point out, because I don't have much time, Oh, there are also many regional bands and local bands. Uh, I may have to stop with this. I want to demonstrate part of the influence of Greek, um, of Greek and American music and the musical group. This is what happened to this group in America, who was Lebanese and had grown up with Lebanese music. But it didn't stop there. It came back to Greece. So this a little in Greece by the 2004 Olympics. This is an odd at the 2004 Olympics representing Greece. It's not a history. It's not the traditional form. It's the American form of this little. That's not. So there has been a group history, a constant group of many groups, which in America, Greek American music and Greek music that continues to listen today and music continues to evolve. Sure. Um, and now I would like to um, call upon Haliopi Peresidi, who is an adjunct professor of classics here at the Department of Linguistics and uh, Intercultural Studies of the University of Thessaly. And Tina and Haliopi, sorry, will uh, talk about evaluating uh, policies as the effectiveness of teachers' professional development using the Delphi methods. Thank you. We're proud of here. Let me. So, good morning, dear chair, dear colleagues, thank you for the opportunity of sharing with you my research named Evaluating Promises as the Effectiveness of Teachers' Professional Development Using the Delft Method. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. So this research focuses on education that is also applicable in social sciences. We all know that teaching is so complex that raises daily challenges and ever-increasing demands. For this reason, it is difficult to predetermine precisely the knowledge and skills that the teacher needs to have in order to effectively respond to his role as a professional. So it is necessary to emphasize the teacher's skills in making wise decisions during the teaching process, for which the ancient Greek thought has catered for, as 
shown in the teacher education literature. In recent years, we have been discussing about the Aristotelian promises, the intellectual virtue with which we choose what must be performed. This term emphasizes the judgment and ability of the teacher as a professional to make practical decisions within the complex and constantly changing educational context of the classroom, school classroom, university classroom, etc. So, is the concept of promises related to the professional development of teachers? To be able to answer affirmatively with certainty, we need to have studied the concept in depth and its correlation with professional development. Such a conceptual mapping of promises documents why we need promises while talking about professional development. From a bibliographic point of view, Aristotelian promises is an intellectual virtue that is perceived as practical wisdom with moral implications, and which includes not so far surpasses episteme, knowledge, and technique, art. It is wise practical reasoning, which is essential in practical life in general, but also in educational practice, as it determines not only the what and how of teaching, but also leads to making decisions about what should be done in cases of moral dilemmas. All these articles are very important, but they approach the concept of promises only secondarily from bibliographic sources that already focus on educational issues and not holistically, as only primary sources allow. Furthermore, in relation to Aristotelian philosophy, there is no mention of the isocratic meaning of promises. Therefore, I have tried to map the concept of promises through the primary sources, approaching it holistically and via not only Aristotelian, but also in Socratic texts. The dialogue, the dialogue between the Socratic and Aristotelian texts highlights many points of convergence, most notably the weighty importance that must be attributed to promises as the purpose of education. We can also deduce a definition of promises. Promises is a good of the soul, acquired through the experience and diligence of the individual himself and those who will reach him based on the throne of logic, namely the logic of the man who has already acquired promises, how to foresee time, circumstances, and events in order to proceed to a corresponding decision at the time and execute an action accordingly. I therefore introduce a tabulation and an analysis of the request of teachers' promises as a new but of classic value paradigm and its implications in the field of professional development. This table has three columns. The first column includes basic qualities of promises. The second one, characteristics that make up each of its qualities. The third column includes equivalents for the teacher professional development. So, promises as an intellectual virtue includes equivalents as, such as teachers' initial education and training, cognition and metacognition, professional expertise, assessment of learning, for learning, and as learning, teaching observation and evaluation. Decision making, which needs professional discernment, action research and problem solving, differentiation of teaching, innovation and creativity, teachers' qualities of perception and intuitiveness, evaluation and transformative learning. Furthermore, teachers promises as an axis, that is one's characteristic built up by habit, equals the teacher's professional identity. They believe in lifelong learning, knowledge constructing, lifelong professional learning itself, exercise, teaching practice, teaching experience, depending on professional career phase. When teachers act with promises as professionals, they seek for self-renewal, self-improvement, self-assessment, self-education. 
but also peer assessment, inter assessment, and they engage in professional learning communities with the guidance of their professional educators. Finally, Jonas's guides leaders to use discourse and educational theory appropriately, performing as reflective practitioners, researchers, and developers. Critical to teachers' completion and effective professional development is the role of the Thronimos, who has already acquired Francis and can be the teacher's expert colleague, expert educator, critical friend, mentor, and coach. So through Thronimos, teachers are guided to the professional self-actualization. Subsequently, I examine the elements that make teachers' professional development effective and potentially contribute to the teacher's promises. For this reason, I present a focused attempt of evaluating the effective professional development of teachers who teach ancient Greek in secondary education in Greece with the new promises using the Delphi method. The Delphi method is inspired by the Oracle of Delphi in ancient Greece, where it is believed that Pythia foresaw the course of events based on the respective data and provided relevant advice. In the Delphi method, the role of Pythia is called upon to be performed by a group of experts who have proven expertise and knowledge on the specific issues under research in order to give an opinion as safe as possible. The Delphi method is based on the expert's consent, and since it uh, ensures anonymity, sequential feedback, quantitative and qualitative type of data, but also validity and reliability, it is proven to be an important evaluation method for issues that need thorough consideration and improvement proposals. So, uh, excuse me for a moment. Thank you. So, um, the questions to be answered are gathered in sets of themes and conceptual statements for which the experts are asked to agree or disagree, suggesting a reformulation and to record any relevant comments. The team of experts consists of 19 people, which is more than satisfactory according to the Delphi method protocol. The scientific specialization and expertise of the panel is also ensured. The evaluation questionnaire consists of two parts. The first part is about the opinions of the experts on teachers' education and professional development in general. And the experts were asked to indicate their degree of agreement or disagreement on a legal scale. As an example, I bought the graph for the eighth item. The second part of the questionnaire is about the description of qualitative characteristics that the professional development of the philologist needs in order to be effective and meeting its promises and at the same time includes the evaluation of the already existing education and training activities of the philologists who teach ancient Greek in secondary education. For this, experts are asked to record their own improvement suggestions and evaluative comments. They mark their agreement or disagreement. In case of disagreement, they note a proposed reformulation to achieve the desired consensus of 70% of the experts in the second or even third round. Only one of the 15 statements had to be reformulated. All 14 remaining statements gathered from the first round the required consensus, and in fact, in high percentages, which shows a very broad consensus of the experts for the statement about professional about promises and professional development of biologists. Unfortunately, there is no time left for me to present you uh, more information about this 
this research, but it may be available later for uh, via the conference record. So, consequently, through the Delphi method, conclusions are drawn and suggestions are made that can be used for the teacher's professional development based on the teacher's promises as delivered by Aristotle and Socrates and adapted to the contemporary needs of educational practice. Thank you so much for your attention. And I think so far we've seen in this panel, we've seen the interplay between the different theoretical concepts, tools, and methodologies that uh, have been used in the search of um, um, important topics uh, in our respective uh, social sciences and humanities, in our respective uh, you know, scientific fields. Um, and I think the approach of uh, a multi paradigm uh, issue is, uh, is, is interesting here. We see that um, we approach uh, different uh, topics with uh, a, a variety of um, approaches and methods, like the Delphi method or the ethnography that uh, Tina was focusing on before. Now we're going to proceed with uh, PPI Institute of Professional Counseling Psychology, Department of um, Psychology here at the National Catholic University of Athens. Uh, and uh, he, her topic is going to be on uh, participatory multimodal study of social issues. In the city of Alexis, community um, exploration and mobilization. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the organizers um, of this uh, panel, um, Vasiliki Chrysanthopoulou and uh, Kevin uh, Arvanitis. This is the first time uh, for me in this uh, conference, and I'm really glad to be part of this um, interdisciplinary um, exchange. Um, in uh, the context of the conference and the panel. Uh, we will be talking uh, about multimodality in qualitative research and uh, via the example of a, part of a participatory study of social issues in the city of uh, LSEs. Um, a few words about multimodality. Uh, it is an interdisciplinary approach that looks beyond language and draws on different modes and resources that people use to communicate, to interact, to represent, and to make meaning, spoken, visual, written, and body special. It questions the strict traditional division of labor among the disciplines on the grounds that the means of sense-making do not operate in isolation. It aims to provide uh, novel methods and frameworks for data production or collection, um, data analysis, presentation of findings, uh, connecting different modes and resources, text, videos, images, enactment, performance, technology, and so on. Uh, of course, there are many challenges um, in trying to um, use uh, multimodal, multimodal methods. And um, there are especially theoretical challenges that uh, researchers face um, more into uh, how to integrate the different modes and, and media used. And basically, I, I would say it's a new field uh, with no real uh, previous theorizing. There, there, have been, um, there has been some work uh, towards this uh, aim, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. Uh, so, uh, I will uh, present in this context um, a study that is, uh, has, we conducted uh, this past year and it's still uh, um, going on. Uh, we haven't uh, finished with all the analysis. Um, 
its transition to aid, bringing social issues, um, tech, and contemporary art. It is a multimodal research project uh, that is implemented by a multidisciplinary team, uh, social scientists, psychologists, uh, technolo uh, mainly psychologists in this uh, team, uh, technology experts, cultural managers, uh, artists and community representatives. So the basic aim of the study is uh, to connect social issues with contemporary art. Um, it takes place in the city of um, LFCs or Elysis, I don't know the, the English pronunciation, um, and it deals with uh, uh, prominent issues uh, in the area that have to do with environment, employment, and refugees migration. Uh, this will be connected with contemporary art and uh, will be presented um, and be part of the European uh, in a festival in the context of uh, LFCs being the European capital of culture in uh, 2023. So the setting it is um, LFCs, uh, it is uh, known in the antiquity as the site of the Eleusinian mysteries and it is the birthplace of Aeschylus. And it is associated with uh, archaeological discoveries in modern times, but also with environmental pollution due to the industrial activity, and uh, which has grown anarchically on the antiquities and next to the residential area. It is uh, considered a working class uh, town. Um, people have come uh, there to work from different parts of uh, Greece. And in 1922, LFCs received uh, uh, many Greek refugee families uh, from Asian Minor. More recently, uh, there are um, refugees from the war and poverty affected areas of the Middle East and, and elsewhere. So this is sort of, you can see in a little bit the anarchy <laughs> between the uh, monuments, the, the industry and, and the residents. Uh, so our uh, um, main goal uh, was to um, use um, uh, ethnography uh, as a way to um, explore people's experiences uh, about these um, issues, uh, environment, uh, refugees and um, uh, labor and um, in connection with um, uh, biometric data uh, that um, was able to um, measure physical reactions. Uh, this all will be transformed into raw materials for art artistic creation and will be presented in the multimedia um, festival. And in this way, it will be um, a way to reach again back to the community. So our methodological choices, um, we employed participatory and multimodal research methods uh, in an effort to um, engage um, the community as much as possible and uh, hopefully have a transformative and um, impact and, and some kind of um, uh, impact. Uh, now, um, I'm going to, I don't know if you can see, um, we started with identification of social issues in the local community. For this, we used um, survey uh, interviews with um, stakeholders of the community and um, um, and also the, the media and uh, uh, from uh, and, and database um, archives. Um, the, the issues that uh, came about were the three issues that I already talked about, the environment, labor and um, refugees. Um, and uh, we used the uh, sociodrama sessions in order 
uh, to explore these issues and um, listen to the voice of, uh, of the residents. And it's, it's a way um, uh, to collect the data uh, that does not uh, emphasize only the cognitive aspect because in the sociodrama, uh, there is acting of roles. So um, there is more spontaneity and uh, there is also a, a possibility uh, of, of expression that goes beyond the um, cognition. Uh, along with um, uh, the sociodrama role playing, uh, some of the participants uh, wore uh, biometric uh, um, watches that uh, could uh, um, measure uh, the physiology. Um, and all of this was uh, analyzed. Um, both uh, uh, via qualitative methods and quantitative for the biometric data. Uh, 20 individuals uh, were, uh, were um, uh, participated um, in, uh, we had two sessions uh, for each uh, the uh, thematic um, topic. Uh, they were all Greek speaking, um, and we tried to use a sample that is as representative as possible of uh, uh, Ulysses. Um, uh, to prepare for sociodrama sessions, uh, we also used experiential walks in the city of Ulysses. Um, there we uh, explained uh, the, the procedure about sociodrama. Um, and uh, the walks were in the areas that are of interest for our topic. Um, so, so drama's data generation, um, it is uh, a, a method that it has been used already, but not as much, uh, but it um, allows uh, for um, a creative way uh, to, to explore um, political and social issues. Uh, also, it, um, it gives us uh, the possibility uh, to connect it with uh, embodied aspects of the experience. Um, and this is again in line with uh, new developments in psychology uh, that um, uh, use more and more the, the body as a way of, uh, of understanding a human experience. Uh, I don't know, I think I'm running, I have some time, okay. So, um, as, uh, as I said before, uh, during the Shadama uh, sessions, um, we use video and audio recording and the biometric data um, was gathered uh, via wearable sensors. These are the walks, and uh, you can see also the sensor that we use. And at the social science level, we adopted a phenomenological perspective because we were interested in participants' experiences. And uh, also phenomenology gives um, emphasis um, in the body, um, as Marlo Pondi has um, uh, pointed out with uh, his work. So um, that uh, helped us uh, connect um, a, a, the experience, um, the, 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 the phenomenology with the embodiment. A, we used um, ethnographic uh, work uh, for uh, uh, the recording of um, the sessions and uh, the uh, later, uh, we um, our work uh, uh, for the analysis was based on the memories and reco uh, uh, recollections of the uh, people that uh, did the observation. We started from that uh, as a way to identify the, the important moments, uh, themes and sessions uh, uh, and, and themes of the session. 
the, we conducted thematic analysis uh, for the content uh, aspect of the of the sessions and um, in what uh, we're um, hoping to do now is uh, to synchronize the verbal the visual and the biometric data um, in an effort uh, to see you know uh, the what uh, would that give us um, in terms of um, a synthesis of, of the different um, multimodal methods that, that we use. And I'm concluding uh, just by saying that mixing methods is a complex and challenging project, and uh, especially because there is no pre-existing specific procedure or mapping uh, when analyzing biometric data. Uh, we hope with this study uh, to, to bring um, something new towards uh, that uh, direction. Uh, so I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Filia. And uh, it seems to me that uh, when we have to research uh, such a, a, you know, complex uh, social issues, uh, we need to be more innovative and utilize the nature of uh, methods and, and approaches. And I think uh, Pilia uh, gave us this sort of um, framework uh, in terms of um, multimodality, how to use these uh, multimodals or meaning making uh, uh, things to, to make meaning. And uh, in pedagogy, we say uh, synesthesia, and I'm going to uh, use this term by my uh, mentors and professor, Mary Galantis and Bilko. So we do a lot of work in terms of multimodality and synesthesia. Uh, in um, education, and another word that they uh, used participatory and transformation. So our approaches need to be more participatory. We don't need to be afraid of using these kind of um, methodologies. Of course, they're more demanding, uh, but uh, they give us a lot of uh, reflection and a lot of consensus, and they give voice to the voiceless, to, to the people that uh, didn't, didn't use to have a voice in our research. Um, so I think it's uh, very important and of course, I've noticed that um, these mixed methodologies are, are really uh, important to uh, be implemented. And now we're going to turn our attention to uh, George Kuzas, Assistant Professor of Urban Folklore, Faculty of Philosophy, Philology, sorry, National Public History University of Athens. And uh, George is going to talk about interdisciplinary approaches to the study of material culture and social life in Greek urban space. George. Uh, good morning, dear friends. I am very happy to be uh, together with you. Uh, first of all, uh, I must say that I'm very happy that uh, it's uh, the second time that I participate uh, in the Cultural Congress. And uh, this is something very important for me. Uh, on the second level, I want to say that uh, uh, congratulations to Vasily Giovai team and also to our co-chair, Evgenia Arvaniti, for uh, the whole organization. Uh, it's very important that uh, this Congress is organized face to face, as you know, or mask to mask, you can say, and uh, not by far like uh, uh, the last Congress uh, two years before. And on a third level, I want to say I'm also very happy because uh, I had the opportunity uh, to see here uh, very good friends like Tina and uh, Gina after uh, many years. So, uh, after philology, psychology, uh, ethnomusicology, uh, let's uh, talk about folklore. Uh, dear friends, uh, this paper doesn't aim at uh, presenting the history of folklore studies in Greece. At the present paper, as we examine the importance of a holistic research in urban space from uh, the folklore perspective. Secondly, the importance of the ethnographic method introduced by Lucatos, and which definitely affected the field of urban folklore in Greece. And see the relation of cooperation between folklorists and social and cultural anthropology with regards to urban space. First of all, in the field of social sciences and humanities in Greece, the science of folklore has been linked either to a Greek 
rural space, and in particular the rural culture of the notion of a uh, seamless 300 years continuum, antiquity, Byzantium, modern Greek civilization. In particular, it has been considered and uh, to a certain extent criticized for being science that systematically ignored the space of the city. This type of criticism has largely concerned Statis Damianakos and other younger researchers, such as Professor Papataxiadis. Both above researchers claim that folklore approaches on social issues have been solely turned towards the past. I believe that the answer is double. Firstly, the science of folklore studies not oriented during the first steps at the beginning of the 20th century towards the past, but examines the social issues beyond a contemporary level and the low degree level, when social and financial developments were very slow. Secondly, it needs to be pointed out that folklore studies are the first that were interested and got actively engaged with the urban space during the period from 1909, when the Greek folklore society was founded until the beginning of the 60s. 1960. Urban space research theory and methodology. Dimitrios Lukatos introduced the ethnographic method of social phenomena. However, his focus has been on research methodology and the perspective of topic examination. To be more specific, with regards to research methodology, Dimitrios Lukatos introduced the ethnographic method of social phenomena research. In example, the examination through field ethnographic research at a certain space and time, and particularly in the city. This contribution is very important as is different support research from the previous method based on limata, lima, lemma, which examined phenomena within time and not on the polarity at present time and was focused more on the notion of 3000 years of continuity. Moreover, Lucatos ethnographic method pushed folklore studies toward more comprehensive, comprehensive and meaningful approaches of urban space topics which were taken into consideration of all social, economic, and cultural parameters of the phenomenon, thus breaking free from the strictly of the reports on the phenomenon. At the same time, it is a uh, high time the scientific perspective was also pointed out. The ethnographic method gave focal studies an analytical perspective of the phenomenon, which is similar to the perspective of other social sciences, as was the case abroad. At this point, folklore studies, apart from simple descriptions, could also examine topics with a scientific thoroughness that did not exist in the past. Finally, one could suggest that Lucatos has been the intermediary link between modern and other folklorists, and on the other main reformers of the modern folkloristics, maybe not as much as a theoretical level, but at a methodological level. Sociological and anthropological dimensions of urban space research. After Lucatos, the torch is being pinged by two new professors, Michalis Meraklis and Dr. Piaget. Meraklis created at the University of Ioannina a scientific school of folklore. He supervised a series of dissertations that were mainly focused on urban ethnography. To be more specific, these studies were based on long term field research with participant observation, semi structured questionnaires and light narrations. Such dissertation brought the science of folklore very close to the science of anthropology. Even though there are researchers who do not make a distinction between these two sciences or consider them as twin sciences, as, for example, uh, Michael Herzfeld, Merakli states that if there uh, are theoretical and methodological similarities between folkloristics and anthropology, they are two uh, distinct sciences, both because of their historical path and because of their theoretical framework in total. Urban ethnography also has been a field uh, with which Alpidiliadid Mestors has also been occupied as a folklorist, folklore professor at the School of Philosophy in Thessaloniki. Kiriakiru performed research on life stories. She was the first to bring the topic of oral history research in Greece. In particular, she performed research on oral life stories and on second and third generation minor refugees living in the urban space of Thessaloniki. However, the collection of these testimonies would not be able without performing field research at the city of Thessaloniki. 
Therefore, even though it was among her initial intentions, in essence, a study of urban space was also conducted through their life stories. Kiriakinos' effort was remarkable, not only because the topic of oral assembly study was introduced the first time in a Greek university, but also mainly because it created the conditions for a creative collaboration between authors and social anthropologists in Greece. The 90s and the next years have been a definitive period for the field of urban folklore studies. First of all, numerous studies which examine urban space from the perspective of folklore and what is more than it in, in an interdisciplinary way are presented at the University of Athens and the University of Ioannina. These studies refer both to Athenian urban space and the peripheral city centers. Secondly, apart from the studies based on field of research, a number of theoretical articles on urban folkloristics that clearly established at this point the theoretical framework of this field in Greece, Greek academic map, can be traced. From 2000 onwards, more specialized research on urban space individual topics, such as street press, the religious life in the city, various agencies, printed sources, social groups in the city, associations and brotherhoods and other topics can be traced. This is a fact that all the studies are based on interdisciplinary research and creatively combine folklore and anthropological theory. This combination fully characterizes urban folklore studies. In the last year, the number of studies on urban folklore in Greece grows. Apart from the big number of urban folklore studies carried out in the Greek University, the field of urban folklore is also developed at the Hellenic Folklore Research Center of the Academy of Athens. During the last decade, more in depth and even more specialized studies could not refer to a city in general, but were more specialized urban life topics, such as, for instance, entertainment in a modern city, city professions, shop and merchant life, etc., can be distinguished. What is more specialized urban photo studies with a more historical direction toward to the past can be traced. It is important to know that Greek urban photo studies systematically deal with the financial crisis too. Two main questions are therefore posed. First, do folklore studies as a science that starting from rural space and deal particularly with the notion of tradition play a role in a world of very big changes, such as the current towns and particularly in the space of the other cities? And secondly, if folklore studies do play a role, how are they differentiated from other relevant sciences, sociology, ethnology, and social anthropology? At this point, the answer could be that folklore studies do have a particularly important role in the study of urban culture. Apart uh, from conducting at the micro level and in depth research on everyday life topics, which are approached by other sciences too, folklore studies and the basic, especially in the Greek case, focus on the development of phenomena, not only within time, in example, to the past, to the present day, but also on the de development within space, in example, from the rural space to the city, and how certain structures and cultural forms have been transformed during these transitions from, from one phase to the other. This is why folklore studies are unique in study topics such as folk life in the city or the divided identity of the former urban resident, characterizing to a large extent the residents of the Greek urban centers. With regard to the second question, it is a fact that even though similar theoretical and methodological tools are used apart to other sciences, folklore studies have their own theory and above all, their own view and perspective of things. Thus, folklore studies are differentiated from the microscopic approaches to sociology and have anthropological approaches focusing more on otherness and what is different. Therefore, folklore studies, through their own perspective, as famous American folklorists and Richard Lawson and others have shown, can contribute to the study of culture and give prominence using their own tools, to phenomena that often skip as unimportant but play an essential role in our everyday life. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, George. George is our uh, co-chair as well for this conference. Uh, and now I would like to call upon um, Virginia Skadadzina, Professor of Architecture and Design of Topology, Department of Interior Design and uh, Graphic Design, Acto Art and Design College, Middlesex University, Athens campus. So her topic is going to be on design of topology and contemporary uh, encounter. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very glad to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, design anthropology and contemporary encounter. Anthropol mm. <laughs> Anthropology and design met in the late 1980s. The matchmaker was the global economy and the need of the market for new improved commercial goods. Digital technology and postmodern movement affected their cooperation on the basis of an interdisciplinary approach. Since then, a new academic subfield was established and flourished rapidly by producing research and theory directly applied to design and production of uh, new industrial products, which already make our lives easier, safer, and more beautiful. Since uh, 35,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens first appeared, the humankind has remained biologically almost unchanged, while socioculturally it has changed radically. Material culture, including two dimensional and three dimensional uh, man made objects, has also changed in form, use, material, and construction techniques and has provided an area for anthropological research. The mankind struggle to find quicker, easier, and more efficient ways of making things triggered four major revolutions, the agricultural or Neolithic, the industrial, the digital, and more recently, the artificial intelligence revolution. All of them had an enormous impact on people's lives by producing radical sociocultural changes. When James Watt accidentally discovered a new force by observing his kettle slid moving up and down while boiling water, the steam engine was invented and used in industrial production. England became the heartland of industrialism because of the British coal and iron industry. Technological evolution and new inventions changed people's lives and material culture worldwide. Steamboats, trains, cars, airplanes, new kinds of buildings and new materials, steel, cement, plastic spread rapidly. New ideologies and social roles emerged, and the existing constructual constructs of aesthetics, education, social, economic, and political organization were transformed in the context of colonialism, urbanization, 
consumerism, capitalism, and world trade. It was in the 19th century, following the Industrial Revolution, that, new, that two new academic disciplines appeared in Europe and the US, anthropology and design. The, the industry needed formally trained designers, and at the same time, both the academia and the governments needed anthropologists. The first government school of design was founded in London in 1837, and the first class of anthropology was given in 1886 at the University of Vermont, USA. Anthropologists went out to Africa, Asia, Australia, and the Americas to do fieldwork and participant observation and study the other. Consequently, anthropology, a new analytic and interpretive academic science was established, providing ethnographic data and social theory on humankind. In the pre-industrial period, the craftsman was the supplier of all man's basic needs. Crafts were objects of natural materials handmade with the use of tools. Maker and designer were the same person. All this changed when machine products started replacing the crafts. Industries based on standardization and mass production of material commodities soon realized that they, need, they needed a person to design for them. So in the 19th century, for the first time in human history, there was a need for formally educated professionals specialized as product designers, engineers, architects, fashion designers, and graphic designers. Consequently, design emerged as an applied discipline, which involves arts, crafts, science, and technology. Design products are culturally intrusive elements and have an interactive relationship with the society as conceptual things. They are products of sociocultural change and at the same time, they produce sociocultural change and often culture shock because at first they look unusual. In the pre-industrial era, form, decoration, materials, and symbolic patterns of buildings and crafts were associated with their geographical, historical, and social context. However, in the post-industrial urban societies, personal choice became gradually a predominant factor in the design process, and consequently, identity became diverse and flexible. The last 170 years, design has been influenced and changed by major movements. The arts and crafts movement, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, the Steel, Futurism, Modernism, and recently Postmodernism, were reactions to the developments of the time. Two movements directly opposite to each other are the arts and crafts movement, which between 1850 and 1915 proposed a revival of the pre-industrial past and futurism, a radical movement against history and tradition. The Futurist Manifesto of 1909 proclaimed that, quotes, a racing car is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. Modernism is the longest living and the most influential movement for more than a century now. It proposed strict design rules and the motto, less is more. Modernist designers applied the principle of the three Fs form, follows, function, and perceived decoration as a crime. 
Architects followed five design rules. Flat roof, elevated first floor, pilotis, plain white exterior walls, long horizontal windows, and open plan in the building's interior. Moreover, the design of material objects from teaspoons to cities were generally unrelated to their natural and social environment. In the context of modernism, Bauhaus, a university in Germany, was set up in 1919, applying an interdisciplinary approach by focusing on the relationship between art, craft, and industry. Before it was closed in 1933 by Hitler, architects, painters, sculptors, weavers, potters, carpenters, and product designers were teaching there, and the industrial objects they produced are still very popular. As an applied science, design had to produce objects that fulfill three requirements, functionality, aesthetics, and symbolism, all united under one concept, a central idea, which is a holistic way, which is sorry, which in, in a holistic way, determines the object's form, pattern, color, texture, light, materials, and eventually its visual identity and branding. After the 1980s, that technology improved massively due to digital evolution, design became even more complex and diverse. The designer's job was not only to make an object attractive and usable according to the physical ergonomics, but also to make, to take into account the user's view, mood, choices, and lifestyle. On the one hand, the more data a designer has regarding the identity of the target group, the more meaningful and useful the new product will be for the users. On the other hand, anthropologists do feel work with real people in their homes, get to know social roles and behaviors and cultural constructions and values. Apparently, in an in interdisciplinary approach, including ethnographic accounts and applying the anthropologist's holistic view in design was needed. So design anthropology emerged because it gives to the user a product with a sociocultural identity and to the designer the potential to work for someone who has age, gender, ethnic origin, religion, and socioeconomic status. It provides knowledge on what real people need and not what the designer sitting in an office thinks that they need. The case of Adidas is a representative example. Adidas is a brand founded in uh, 1948 that had always been associated with elite athletic performance. But in the early uh, 2000s, anthropologists in collaboration with Adidas designers did ethnographic research. They spent 24 hours straight with customers, eating breakfast with them, joining them on runs, and asking them why they worked out. Finally, it became clear that customers wanted products to help them lead healthy lifestyles, not win competitions. Running, walking, biking, jogging, going to yoga and the gym, were the new urban sports. Since the consumer's definition of sport had changed, the company eventually changed along with it. Today, many multinational or local, large or small companies and freelance designers turn to anthropologists. Corporate ethnographers conduct interviewing, observation of the users in their environments look for patterns of behavior and help high-tech companies and industrial firms to understand customers' 
and adapt to fast changing markets. Companies like Intel, Dell, IBM, Apple, Xerox, Motorola, Google, Miller, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and Microsoft increasingly either hire anthropologists or cooperate with design ethnographic consultancies who do anthropological research and analysis for them before a new project goes to the designer's office. Digital evolution coincides with postmodernism, a contemporary art and design movement of the 1980s. Postmodernism is an ideational construct that influenced both anthropology and design and is encoded on design objects like Michael Graves' tea and coffee piazza and the buildings like Frank, Lloyd, Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum at Bilbao and the dancers in Prague. Postmodernism and deconstruction uh, were reactions to modernism. Less is more was the motto of modernism. Less is bore was the answer of postmodernism. Nevertheless, contemporary design is still influenced, influenced by modernism, while postmodernism determines mainly the decorative elements and the outshell. Postmodern design almost excludes context, social, historical, geographical, and rules, except those related to functionality and engineering and allows symbolism and the signature of the designer to be projected. Objects can be inventive, unusual, funny, and even crazy because everything is permitted regarding form, colors, textures, and decorative patterns. Although postmodern design provides a sense of freedom, this mix and match result has received criticism for ignoring sociocultural identity, which traditionally united a building or a thing with a certain place, time in history, and the members of a society. In the contemporary post-industrial urban Western context, designers often draw on ethnographic data in order to get inspiration and formulate a concept. Such example of less or more su successful postmodernist objects, buildings and fashion or art items are produced worldwide, Greece included. I will briefly refer to some examples of published, exhibited, and broadly known art and design works to show how particular contemporary designers work in specific contexts. Their creations include photographs, jewelry, and the building, all of them related to Carpathos, a Greek island in the southeastern Aegean which is characterized by a rich pre-industrial local tradition. Photography is a post-industrial form of art. Its photograph is an artist's unique creation influenced by art movements and technological innovations with aesthetic beauty and symbolic value. Until the 1980s, Photographers usually photographed persons doing their regular activities within their physical and social environment. In the 1960s, Costantinos Manos, an American photographer traveled the Greek countryside and captured black and white photographs of remote rural places and their traditional way of life that in his words, quotes, reflect survival, honor, and continuity. Among other places, he also visited Carpathos. 
More recently, Michael Papas, a Greek photographer who travels all over Greece and makes images of customs and traditional events, also visited Carpathos. His color photographs influenced by postmodernism focus on local traditional Greek costumes, emphasizing symbolic dimensions and highlighting quotes, popular culture and folk art in contem a contemporary context, as he explains. Photographs are not spontaneous. His protagonists are posing, wearing their costumes, while a natural and cultural environment is used as the background. The traditional Carpathian house is a basic cultural element of the local vernacular ar architecture. Its form, function, and symbolism was developed during the past centuries in the pre-industrial era, and all the included material objects have certain meaning and value for the Carpathians and all those who share this knowledge. Many new houses, hotels, and other kinds of buildings designed by Greek and foreign architects are at the, at the, are the last years built in Carpathos, uh, mainly outside the existing villages. Since copy-paste in design is not ethically permitted, the designer needs to get ideas from the local environment in order to create something original and unique by blending creatively the old and the new. Following the postmodernism, uh, often new buildings are either totally out of context or they use selectively some unrelated to each other elements. The result of this mixture of forms, materials, and new aesthetic and symbolic codes characterizes the patio house designed by a Scandinavian firm, the OOAK Architects. Among other elements, the interior decoration includes dishes hanged on the wall as a link to the local vernacular architectural pattern. In the traditional Carpathian house, the wall dishes were symbols of the family's history and the relation of the island with the broader world through migration. Sofia Papacosta is a historian archaeologist who designs handcrafted jewelry. Her designs are inspired by ancient jewelry and other cultures, but they are mostly influenced by her Carpathian heritage regarding forms, colors, patterns, and techniques. By looking her designs in relations to the local women's traditional dresses and jewelry, as well um, as the local traditional houses interior decoration, one can see the unique creative way in which her heritage is expressed in her postmodern design. What all the above cases have in common is that they are contemporary postmodern products of artists and designers who get more or less inspiration by drawing on ethnographic material related to Carpathos tradition and vernacular architecture. Design anthropology, a contemporary encounter of two relatively new disciplines, has already produced results materially manifested. Under the influence of digi digital revolution and the postmodern movement, it tends to provide us with a variety of designed material objects and buildings. Lately, scholars from the fields of anthropology and design are increasingly engaged on trying to define this new academic subfield. Is it anthropology of design, anthropology for design, or design for anthropology? In any case, design anthropology represents a contemporary case of interdisciplinary approach between two major disciplines of the post-industrial era, interrelated 
to sociocultural change. Obviously, interdisciplinary teams in which anthropologists provide the theory and the methodology, and designers provide creativity and inspiration, can create a better material world and change our lives for the best. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now any questions? I think we took a lot of time to uh, discuss all these uh, different uh, topics. And um, uh, I would like to ask Vasiliki to say a few words uh, in giving the uh, summary of uh, you know, ideas and po points made. And then we will welcome some uh, questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? <clears throat> Oops. Okay. Uh, well, uh, first, let me congratulate and thank warmly the members of this panel for their rich and insightful uh, presentations. We have heard about the challenges and the strategies employed by scholars in different fields of the social sciences and the humanities in the past and today in Greece and in other parts of the world. Uh, the issues, challenges and strategies described by our speakers were drawn from Greek and international examples. Indeed, we see that uh, we cannot talk simply about things happening in Greece or to people in Greece, as the issues we heard about concern people of different ethnic and cultural origin in Greece or in other parts of the world. The local is intertwined with the global, both in terms of the groups that social scientists and scholars in the humanities conduct research on, and also in terms of the methodologies they employ and the strategies they pursue. Uh, okay, uh, some general points that I would like, that we are made and I would like to summarize are that our speakers, all our speakers, I think, have delved into the past to explain how things stand at the moment. Second, uh, the connection with society uh, the relevance to society that our um, uh, research uh, needs to have. Um, for example, uh, in uh, Tina Bukuvalas' uh, uh, paper, uh, we need to look at the exchanges and interfertilization between uh, countries and their diasporas as uh, uh, is the case of um, um, uh, Greek music in America, what um, uh, such cross fertilization means. In uh, uh, Calliope Feresidis' um, paper, uh, they need to look at texts, uh, even ancient texts, uh, to draw inspiration from them. Um, as in the case of, uh, um, for example, the, uh, and, and draw concepts which may be relevant to today's research, uh, such as uh, the concept of phronesis, the Aristotelian concept of phronesis, um, and the Delphi method uh, as applied to the uh, uh, teaching of ancient Greek in secondary school education. Now, uh, moving to Philia Isaris' um, paper, uh, the need to look uh, at a mixing of models, uh, multimodality, uh, social drama, to move away from text uh, to body uh, and uh, employ um, uh, the concept of um, 
you know, embodiment and phenomenological approaches uh, to contemporary uh, studies of social issues uh, in connection with uh, uh, the technology available to us and uh, in relation to contemporary art, a kind of circular model in a way. Um, now, what I would like to say in relation to this uh, is that um, as Eugenia has already pointed out, uh, there is in fact theorizing uh, in relation to multimodality um, from other social sciences too, uh, such as uh, anthropology uh, and also um, education. Uh, so we see that we still need to, to have more interdisciplinary exchanges and dialogue between us uh, to help each other. Um, George Kuzas reminded us that uh, uh, we need to look at um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, connections uh, in the development of our disciplines, um, such as in urban folklore, in his case, but also um, we should always be aware of the distinctive tradition that each one of these disciplines brings along to the dialogue, and this is a great plus too. And finally, um, Virginia Gina Schiada's um, paper uh, on uh, uh, design anthropology, um, talking about this new field that has not decided about its name yet. Um, the important thing is to see uh, the, the, the focus that she has shown us on uh, the real needs that people have and that uh, this market that, that we talk about uh, as if it were something distant and away from us uh, should not be seen as uh, distanced and apart from the real needs uh, of people and that it is something that uh, we ourselves create and um, um, should be aware of this. Uh, so uh, uh, these are some, <laughs> this is a kind of summary of um, um, some points. Uh, and uh, I have got a couple of questions that uh, if there is time, uh, I'm going to um, uh, thank mention. You. Thank you. And we'll ask now, uh, sorry for the interruption, but uh, I'm uh, uh, no, urged to ask some questions from the audience. If uh, there is any anything, but of course we can uh, uh, continue the, the discussion or start the discussion, meet the panelists uh, at the, the, the coffee break and uh, raise your questions there. But uh, if we have here some um, points from the audience, Ned George. Louder, louder. No, or speak louder. Uh, the questions, sorry, should be asked from the microphone for those of us who are watching online. We can't hear. All right. Thank you, Vasiliki, for the intervention. I think that you are the, the, the real president. <laughs> uh, I want uh, uh, to ask Ilya uh, uh, from this very interesting paper. Uh, in your field of psychology, the last decade or the last year, we have more uh, quantitative researches or more qualitative researches. That means that um, uh, if you, you have uh, more quality than researches, uh, you, you can combine some tools from our sciences, like uh, participant observations, semi structures, questionnaires, or um, uh, life narrations uh, for your researches. And I want to ask that because uh, many, many years before, when I was studying uh, philology here in the faculty of philosophy, 
Uh, I have seen that uh, most uh, researches, uh, most ecological researches, um, were based on uh, quantitative uh, methods. And that's a question. And also, uh, and I, I'm asking that because um, I was uh, conducting a research about gossip uh, in uh, the modern uh, Greek society. And uh, I have uh, found it in the biography many uh, psychological uh, papers about gossip uh, from America and from other uh, countries in the world based on ethnographic tools. And I want to ask you that about today in your science field, um, people have more uh, ethnographic tools or uh, your uh, pursuit the other tools of the quantitative research, okay? Thank you, George. Um, thank you for this uh, question, uh, which is close to my heart with this uh, whole subject of um, <clears throat> methods in psychology, which traditionally, uh, you're right, has been uh, quantitative. Uh, nevertheless, uh, more in more recent years, um, there is a great interest in qualitative methods. And uh, even in um, prestigious journals in the field, uh, we have uh, more and more uh, qualitative work that is being published. And also mixed methods, you know, which is uh, another trend uh, in social sciences. And personally, I'm very fond uh, of qualitative work. I think it's. Um, a way to, to understand human nature uh, better in some sense, or in a different way, you know, because each methodology has its advantages. Uh, but um, definitely a, a, a ethnographic work in, in the field of psychology, there is less. Uh, other qualitative methods uh, like uh, in, uh, semi-structure interviews or focus groups are used more uh, often. Uh, but there is also some um, ethnographic work that is, um, is, is used, and uh, for sure, their uh, anthropology has a, a great influence uh, on that. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. And any, any other questions from, uh, from the audience? Otherwise, we will conclude uh, just to allow you to have a coffee and then continue some uh, discussion with our uh, panelists on the coffee break. Um, I think we, we got a bit of uh, information today and we can combine in our respective fields. Education, for example, can combine all these approaches uh, mentioned today from the design, from uh, psychology, ethnography, music, everything. Uh, and uh, I think we had some um, years ago, we uh, started uh, an attempt with Vasiliki Kisakopoulou to combine the folklore and anthropology with uh, the educational uh, sort of uh, and professional development uh, with respect to teachers. So I think there is a, um, a ground that we can combine our forces and join forces to become more productive for, uh, for our students and uh, our researchers. So I'd like to thank you, Vasiliki, our chair of the conference, and thank you all for your uh, patience today and the panelists, thanks for the discussion. And of course, Vasiliki has to have the, the, the final word. All right, go ahead. Uh, Let me thank go. you. Thank you, Eugenia, and for this um, wonderful moderating that you've uh, conducted. I just wanted to um, uh, just mention the questions that I had in mind, just to, 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 uh, for people, for, for our panelists, but also for the audience to think about them. Uh, and these are, these are two in connection with the, the focus of our conference. Um, do you think that uh, any important epistemic paradigms, heterodox or not, have been employed in your discipline over the recent years, or that any old paradigms or important concepts have been reactivated, reinterpreted, redefined, and are now being employed? Um, and the second question uh, regards us as scholars. 
uh, how are currently used methodologies in your discipline influencing the way you view and pursue your role as a scholar uh, and a socially aware and conscious citizen? Have these new tendencies and methods affected the way you practice your research? Just uh, food for thought, and thank you very much. Thank you, Vasiliki. Um, I think we're going to discuss that on uh, over our uh, break. But that was very important to have to you initiate this reflection and keep going with uh, a reflexive uh, and more uh, collective sort of uh, thinking uh, on these issues. Thank you for that, and thank you all, guys. So and uh, folks. So we can actually disengage ourselves and have some coffee. Thank you. Going to the for the eighth floor. Thank you too. Thank you too. That's what's in, that's what's in